And what I have to show you here is, you know, that something that becomes uh, somewhat pivotal in the novel is that when Jack's father leaves, mm -hmm. the last thing he does is he gives his son his wallet. He says, here, take this. There's a few bucks in it. And he certainly doesn't need any of the ID that's in it because they're going to create them all new ones. Welcome to our latest Book Reporter Talks to Interview, where our guest today is Linwood Barkley, a frequent guest. We love talking to Linwood. And we're going to be talking about his new book, The Lie Maker. Our reviewer, Ray Palin, had this to say about it. The Lie Maker is filled with such imaginative plot twists and turns that becomes physically impossible to put the book down at any point. It's easily one of the best thrillers of 2023. It also received this praise from that small paper, the Wall Street Journal. It takes a gifted writer to perfectly balance all the suspense, wit, violence, and poignance in a book such as this. Lucky for us, Mr. Barclay is one of the best in the business. Oh, and yes, it's going to be a book reporter bets on selection. You know, book reporter, the New Wall Street Journal, and me. Okay, so there you go, folks. Welcome, Linwood. So great to see you as always. It's so nice to see you, Carol. Always so let Let's begin by you telling us a little bit about The Lie Maker. We're, what's the plot about this time? Sure. So The Lie Maker is about a writer named Jack Gibbons. And Jack Gibbons is a not a very successful writer. He's had a couple of books out that were critically well received, but didn't sell a whole lot. And so he's about to consider a career working in trade magazines when he is approached with a very unusual offer by the uh, folks who are the, with the witness, uh, WITSEC, the witness Relocation Program. And they say to him, look, uh, we're really good at protecting people and setting them up in another place and so forth. But we're not very creative. And these people need new backstories, a created backstory that they can tell people, oh, I'm from here, I'm from there. And we've read your books, and yeah, you didn't sell a lot, but you have a really good sense of character and so forth. And we would like to hire you to write the backstories for these people. And they're offering a fair chunk of change, too. And And... And not only does Jack think this is kind of interesting offer, but it's particularly interesting because clearly what they're unaware of is that when he was a kid, his own father left him and his mom and went into the witness protection program because of, he was testifying against a very bad person. And the mother, Jack's mom, thought, I'm not paying for your mistakes. We're not going with you. And his dad went off the program. Jack grew up under another name when his mom met somebody else. And so with this, having been approached by the agency, he thinks, well, if I work for them, maybe I can worm my way into their good, their good, you know, their hearts, and they'll connect me all these years later with my father. And uh, as often is the case in these uh, kind of books, mayhem ensues. <laughs> Absolutely mayhem ensues. What inspired you to write it? Like witness protection? Is it something you've given thought to? Well, at first I was thinking about doing a book about, like a, uh, I actually had the idea, I think it'd be great to do a TV series that was just about witness protection uh, program. And then I thought, oh, I don't know enough about it. And then I thought, what if I narrowed the focus completely down and brought it to, 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 to a character that I know something about as a writer? Mm -hmm. And I thought, there's my angle. And then the other thing that, that sort of worked its way into the story is, and I'm going to reach over to my desk here, and what I have to show you here is, you know, that something that becomes uh, somewhat pivotal in the novel is that when Jack's father leaves, mm -hmm. the last thing he does is he gives his son his wallet. He says, here, take this. There's a few bucks in it. And he certainly doesn't need any of the ID that's in it because they're going to create them all new ones. So this, what I have here in my hand, this is my father's wallet. Wow. And this has been, my dad died when I was 16. He was only 59 years old. And I always hung on to this wallet. And this wallet has always been in whatever desk I had at the time. And it's been in my desk for more than half a century. Wow. One day on Twitter, I just posted a picture of the wallet. And I said, this is my dad's wallet. He died when I was 16. It's been in my desk for 50 years. I just said that. And... Stephen King saw that and he retweeted it and it just went nuts. Wow. So all these people said, I still have my mother's, you know, letters. I still have my dad's hat. You know, all this stuff started just coming out, just bubbling to the surface. And I thought, 
there's something there. Mm -hmm. And so this wallet became part of the novel. So, so is there any money in that wallet? No, but you know what there is? What? It's ID? There's a, is, there's a driver's license, car insurance, uh, membership with the Masons, and a picture of me. Oh, I love it. I love it. There's the wallet. A picture of me. And also in here, because we had moved to Canada, his, his a photostat of his landed immigrant status in Canada, having moved up from the U.S. That's in Oh, my gosh. Very so, cool. yeah, so I've always had this. And, um, you know, what can I say? What do we got here? I don't remember this. This is, oh, this is a um, library card. Oh, I love it. This is great. So there's. So that's, kind of, that's kind of where that whole book came. That's how it kind of came together. Came to, so there's this really great line at the start. It said, your dad's not a good person. Your dad killed people's son. Did you always have that line? Because it's just, it's a killer line. It's just oh, yeah. I, I, I wish that I did. You know what? I had written that chapter and I got to the end and there was something else there. And it was my agent, Helen Heller, who said, you know what would be a better line there would be something along the lines of this. So it pains me greatly to have to <laughs> say that someone else deserves some credit for that line. You have no idea how, how, cut, how that cuts deeply. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But I like the Jack retorts. Can you not just say sorry? Because that's what he gets in his head. The kids do. When you do something bad, you can just say you're sorry. And yeah. at a very young age, he learns you can't just do that. So I just thought yeah, that was I so said there's, appropriate. There's, uh, Dad says there's some things that sorry won't cut it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah. he, killing people is in that on that list. <laughs> Killing people, stealing stuff from bad people. Those are the things. So Jack's left with his mom. And there are lots of questions about why they didn't leave. Like he really kind of says to his mother, like, why didn't we go? Why didn't we do this? He doesn't understand this is his dad's problem. The mother's laying it on him, blah, blah, blah. So it puts him in a really precarious place because he's a boy and he sort of needs his mom. And, or his dad, rather. And dad's not there. And then mom brings on the stepdad. That's not the dad you wanted either. He's not the... Uh, your dad out of the box, but he's a pretty interesting character, Earl. Yeah, Earl is this uh, stepdad who comes in, and Earl's not really a villain, but Earl's kind of a loser. <laughs> Earl is always looking for a get-rich scheme, you know, something that, so he can coast for a long time, and if he gets a whole lot of money here, and I, I mean, it's funny, I'm trying to remember what it was, because I wrote the book a while ago, right? I'm trying to remember what, I think he sunk a whole bunch of money into some sort of a health food store between a Burger King and a McDonald's or something. And that didn't fly. Who knows why? <laughs> and and uh, and he ended up uh, putting more money into some uh, units in a Florida high rise that pancaked, that yeah, crushed. Right. You may right. Just but uh, so and so when 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 uh, when Jack is just like got no money. Right. And Earl's asking him for loans. You know, can I get some money? He says, you, you don't get it. And Earl's one of these people who has a lot of misconceptions about the publishing industry, that once you get a book published, well, <laughs> you, never have, you never have to work again. And uh, so so Earl's kind of, uh, but Earl does play an important role as mm -hmm. the story goes on. Yeah, as things move along. You know, I've always thought that with witness protection, you get whisked away what do you get to keep what do you get to lose you know, like what what do you lose in the you know as you're leaving and it ends up that you don't take much you take like no. yourself and your family lisa scottolini wrote about this in her last thriller what happened to the bennett's and the entire family disappears but you realize that they're still looking for you at book club they're still wondering where you are at school you're just gone and i never really thought about that so is this an idea you've ruminated on for a while of like well, oh you're gone and gone not not too much i mean i really i think i was really focused on jack and how, what this does to a kid uh it's funny i was doing an interview on tv the other day and and they said wow this is fascinating does the witness protection program really do this hire writers to write backstories and i said they do in this book. <laughs> this is the one, folks. This is where you get it, you know? This is the, they do it in this book. Yeah. Now, I have to just interject here. If it looks like I've got some sort of sunburn on my face, it's because 
this is the this is my office and the sun sets right there and I've pulled these blinds down the sun's still coming through and it looks like I hope his face doesn't burst into flames you know <laughs> looks a bit at least on my monitor it looks that way no you're you're just a thriller writer we're totally fine with it if it bursts into flames it'd be like wow look what he pulled off right. you know like seriously you know but I love the check it's his job writing these bios for the people and then all of a sudden you realize it's like maybe I need to meet the person because right. if the guy is like 610 or something like that he's not going to be able to fit in this kind of a job or that kind of a job so we need some basic characteristics and he asks to do this and it's kind of pivotal in the book that he does this that's right because they you know uh uh they say to him just just start writing backstories just start writing some and they just sort of without knowing anything so he starts writing and that's when he realizes well look you know i've what am I supposed to do? Say this guy's a rodeo clown or what? You know, and it turns out he's very serious and you know, it just doesn't fit. So that's when he says, he, he concludes, he says, what I'm trying to do is make a suit for someone that I can't measure. Mm -hmm. and, and so he insists that he wants to meet the individual for whom he's writing this first backstory. Right. And so this whole thing has to be set up and they have to take him out to this isolated location. He's got to be blindfold, can't know where he's going so that he can meet this guy and and I think then the guy meets him at the door and says, so you're my lie maker. You know, you're my guy who's going to create this backstory for me. And, um, you know, but uh, but uh, and I think that's a real kind of eye opener at that point for Jack, because he starts to get a sense knowing what this guy has been going through and, and these sort of very bad people who were looking for him, the sort of stuff that his father must have gone through. Right, and it's not a lot of spoil. Just to just to 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 sort of whet the appetite, um, you know, he he spends all his time trying. He starts to see whether, in fact, they would connect him mm -hmm. with his dad. And when they sort of make some inquiries about whether to decide whether to do this, they can't find him. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it becomes possible that maybe Jack's long lost dad is in some kind of deep trouble. Well, everyone who's listening right now, I just want you to know that this is the book I was reading until 3 a.m. And the next night I read it till 3 a.m. And the only reason I stopped is because I had to work the next day because the book is that good. Because you're going to get on this ride and it's going to be, oh, I'll just read a little bit more. And it's 3 a.m. So two, 3 a.m. nights. There you go. Yeah, but what you're not telling them is you don't start reading until 1 a.m., right? <laughs> no, I do. <laughs> Sorry. One night I started late, the other night I started earlier. But no, I finished another book and I was like, I'm going to pick this up. And then it's like, oh no, you're not just picking this up. You're in for the ride. You're there. You're there. So then we've got Lana, his girlfriend, is this terrific character. She works for a newspaper, as you did, which I think you had a little bit of fun with that. Because I ever, whenever you put somebody in the newspaper business, it's always they can't get the story they exactly want. There's always something they want that doesn't connect. Or they're sent to cover something that they really have no interest in covering, or you know, like the obligations of what they have to do. And I have to, and also, I have to be really careful. Nobody who works at a newspaper ever says scoop. I just <laughs> want to make that known right now. Nobody ever says, I've got a scoop. And looks they're in like a 1930s movie. Doesn't happen. Right. So because a lot of news newspaper work is kind of a immense amount of drudgery, uh, interrupted by occasional holy mackerel stuff, you know, <clears throat> which I know well. Excuse me. The holy mackerel you're really into. The holy mackerel you're yeah. there for. Oh, I mean, I worked, I worked, I worked three decades at newspapers. And, uh, you know, and I can remember coming in on, a, when you came in on the midnight editing shift on the overnight desk on the city desk and coming in at 11 o'clock at night. And they, when they tell you, boy, it's a quiet dead night. That's like, like that's nobody should even say that because the night that somebody said that to me at eleven twenty, they just the whole world just blew up, you know. Right. So, so it's an interesting look. So I think it's the kind of thing I can, you know, certainly when I have characters who work in newspapers, I feel I can bring a little authenticity to it. Yeah, you know? yeah. <clears throat> and also, she comes from this wealthy family, and family is stressed here more than her wealth. I think Jack loves the idea that she has a family. But he's very cognizant that he doesn't have one to introduce her to, like meet Earl. Mm, not going to go so well. <laughs> and I think that he wants to know more of him. But that would be meeting his dad. That would not be who 
we have to say he's seen a couple of times through the years. Like he's seen his dad a couple of times, but his dad's now missing and he really wants this woman in his life. But I think he really wants her to meet somebody that mattered to him as well. And there's nobody yeah, left. And I think he also wants to be straight with her. Look, before, you know, I popped the question or before we, we settle together, there's stuff you need to know about me. You need to know about my background. And, and I, you know, and I was, he wants to be straight with her. So he would like her to meet his dad he would like yeah. his dad to meet her and know that he's grown up he's found someone special and so forth and uh and you know and it's and, tr and you try to look at it from from his girlfriend's point of view to find out oh so my boyfriend is his dad was a hired killer mm. that's a new one yeah Bring i that thought my on. dad was just weird having collecting toy trains or whatever you know but this <laughs> is on another level <laughs> whole different level here and then you know there's an example of like random things that happen i love that lana carries things like a hard hat and a safety vest in the trunk of oh, her yeah. car like these well, things come up so she's reporting that's on the standard car. that is standard equipment yeah, yeah. <laughs> so she's got all this stuff and what she was carrying i never would have thought about like i never would have thought but you weave these things in so even the back of the car i feel like i'm seeing i'm seeing everything that's happening in this book when you're writing these characters, do you sketch out what they're going to do in advance or draw them in advance? Or do they just happen as you're going? It kind of happens as I go. Okay. I like, I like to know the big the big picture, overall picture of the story, like the whole sort of overall arc. Mm -hmm. um, but the opportunities that exist don't really, uh, you know, I, I'm not aware of them until I kind of get to them. Like, oh, I could do this. I could do that. Oh, you know, I, I compare it to, I just like, if you get in a car in New York and you're driving to LA, you know where you're gonna end up, but you have a hundred ways to get there. Right. So right. Uh, so it's kind of like that, you know? And, uh, but it's true. I mean, I, I, you know, I knew all these guys. I was, most of my time in newspapers was uh, either as an editor or a columnist. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I watched all how the really great investigative reporters know what they did. I mean, they, they, they kept the clipboard and the hard hat in the trunk because they said, you can go just about anywhere with a hard hat and a clipboard. Like you just could go into anything, you know. Just look like you belong. Look like you belong yeah. when you're there. Look like you belong. You know, it did not escape me that there are many mentions of cars in this book and how cars drive, the features of the cars, how cars come together. And I know your dad was a car illustrator. And in this drive, pun intended, your interest in cars and putting them into the books these ways. Well, you know, it's just kind of it's, you know, it's probably someone who is interested in fashion will describe what every character is wearing. You know, I just love cars. So I just, I don't, I usually think, well, you know, we have to know what he's driving. And, and, uh, and of course the last book I had done, it was a little offshoot and it was entirely about cars. It was yes. about self-driving vehicles running amok. And, um, you know, so, so it always ends up, it's funny, a friend of mine, a professor, he said, he was, when years ago, he was introducing me at something, he said, in every, in every little book, you'll always know what everyone's driving. Yes, it's true. Yeah. It's true. And the cars and where they're going to go. And even in the last book, it was the blue car, it was this car, you knew all about the yeah. cars. You know? I mean, it's like, you know, like, don't go away, I'm going to grab a book here. So it's yeah. just, yeah. I mean, so when I, when I did uh, this book, Look Both Ways, right. <clears throat> Uh, I was able to put onto the title page this illustration. Yeah. Which that is not a photograph. That is yeah. an airbrushed illustration of a 59 Cadillac. And my dad drew that car. That's what wow. he did for a living, worked in advertising and was a car illustrator. Yeah. And uh, so, so I grew up surrounded by automotive imagery, you know. And I'm told that when I was two years old, my parents could stand me on the sidewalk. And I could identify every car going by. That's a Buick. That's a DeSoto. I knew them all. Wow. Wow. wow, wow. Yeah, what did he drive? What did your dad drive? What did my dad drive? For the, most, for the most part, he drove mostly, well, most, mostly <clears throat> for a while he was driving Fords because he was doing the Ford account. Okay. And so we had a, like a 55 Ford station wagon and then a 1959 Ford Fairlane and a, like a 60 or 61 Ford station wagon. And then when he stopped working in advertising, he got a Dodge. Valera, but I, about a year and a half before he died, we were at a uh, Dodge lot, and they had on the lot um, a Dodge Charger, this beautiful Dodge Charger. I said, Dad, you should trade in this boring Polara and get that. And he said, oh, your mother would never, ever go for that. 
And and two days later, he came home with it. Wow, I love it. I love such, it. Such a sweet car. It was such a great car. And and the sad irony of it is, is that when I was 16, he died. And my mom didn't drive. And by default, that was my car. Because I did all the family driving. I did, you know, I took my own place. I did all that. So I had this fabulous cool car to drive around in although i wish i had come come by it a different way yeah 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 yeah. that's not the way you want to come up the car my dad for years was the buick guy and then he was oldsmobiles and then after that he's driving a lincoln right now and a toyota camry like he still's got my mom's toyota camry and we just sit there like this is like so bizarre you know just so but but it's like he loves cars my dad goes out and watches the cars all day long like he just yeah. loves doing this keeping the cars clean you get in his car you think it's like brand new he'll go look at this one it's only got twenty five thousand miles on it every time I just, go, <laughs> i'm an absolute fanatic about a clean car yep yep he's a fanatic about a clean car um the other day we went into the garage and we said uh, my husband goes like this in the car and he goes hey al look there's dust on the car my father goes oh you should see the other side where the woman hit me now, I just want you to know, I talk to my 93-year-old father every night, never came up as a subject, never heard about the car. Meanwhile, he's had the accident. It is the woman's fault, believe it or not. He's 93. It's her fault. And it's on the police report. And he's already gotten the estimate for getting the car fixed. But have I heard one word about this? No, not one sentence <laughs> about this. And I said to my husband, like, seriously? Yeah. So... That brings me to, there's also a lot of humor in your writing. And when Jack loses the job before it even starts, you even drop the humor into the names of these niche magazines. He's going to be working for these magazines that are like, you know, what is it? The one that they think is going to work is still the Winnebago one, but the others are just not going to work anymore. I was cracking up. Yeah, you know, it's, and and yeah, he's all these sort of bizarre trade magazines that that, that really exist, you know. <laughs> Okay, what's really funny is last year, I made the cover of Mechanical Engineer in Canada because they just like to, in every issue, have some sort of little interview with somebody who's well-known to sort of boost their circulation. So I'm on the cover of Mechanical Engineer. You should, my daughter-in-law, I thought we'd have to send her to the hospital. She laughed so hard. And so, but but there's all these little niche magazines. And and I mean, I should know, I'm a guy who buys model railroader every month. And <laughs> And so I remember my mom used to buy when we ran this trailer park, you know, when I was a kid, which I took over running up to 16, you know, she subscribed. Who knew there was a magazine called Trailer Life? Because I'm <laughs> going to tell you, living in a trailer is not a life. It's just not a life. So so he's working for this like RV life and, you know, all these ridiculous trade magazines. And, and of course, he gets fired on the first day on the job because of, uh, well, I won't get into that. But well, there's it's, no business. There's no advertising business. I love the specs. Well, except yeah, for yeah. except for the Winnebago one. Everything else. Yeah, they're is doing well. Work. But they had they had a, a one one of the trade magazines is for operators of movie cinemas, which just went, kind of went dark during the pandemic. So that one just died. And of course, the other thing they do is they they'll write articles not because they're good articles to write, but because they'll write about an advertiser. So then they'll buy an ad in the right. magazine, ad, what we call advertorial. <laughs> Totally which is the curse the curse of the industry i remember doing advertorials when i was at the magazine it's like we're going to do an advertorial and we're going to write about it. And i'm like yeah yeah i can't even believe we're doing this you know so people are saying this is your best book and i'm hearing that from people heard from our reviewer i know you're hearing it as well what do you think it is that people are like attracted to with the book what do you think it does I, on? I think sometimes that the author is the last one to know um uh, it didn't occur to me that it was my best. We're a very good friend of mine. He read, he said, absolutely, this is your best one. And and so it seems rude to argue, you know, like, no, you're wrong. And it's just, <laughs> I, I still think the best book I ever read was Trust Your Eyes, which was like 10 years ago or whatever. And, but, you know, I, and I think there's something about the title, mm -hmm. the line maker. So every, just about everybody thinks that it must be about Name your the politician you dislike most. Right, you know, right, right. Yeah, there you go. It's got to be about some sort of politician, and and uh, so I think the lot. I think that the title is kind of hitting a nerve, but I, and also the sense of of you know uh, being abandoned as a kid. Mm -hmm. I think also. I mean, that's you know when I did a book 
back in 2008 called No Time for Goodbye, mm -hmm. which was about that. And that was my, my biggest book I've ever had. So, you know, maybe it's that. But um, I mean, I think when you when you write a book as an author, you're the last one is like, is this any good is or is it just terrible? And yeah. people will let you know. Was this always the title? No. Uh, I my original story, uh, um, title was Backstory, which I thought was a good title, although it happened to be uh, also the title of one of Robert B. Parker Spencer novels about 25 years ago. But we thought that was long enough ago. But they, nobody uh, in uh, the publishing house got excited about that. So we went around for a while. And then actually, I came up with that. Uh, and everybody liked that. I really, really like it. I really, really do. Was this always the cover? Like going out to no, nowhere? It was another cover. And the UK cover is completely different. Yeah. Uh, but this, the, but then we came up with that. They had uh, they had an earlier version, which I was less fussy about. And then I had some suggestions. And then they came back with this. And I thought, oh, I like, I like that. That's very moody. No, it's really, really, really terrific. Um, the audio is narrated by Jonathan McLean and Graham Halstead. What role were they each playing? Do you know if they're doing different voices or how that I'm not playing? that I'm not sure about, but I have an interesting story of quickly about Jonathan McLean. Oh, good. Okay. We like stories. So so um it's just one of those small world stories. So a few months ago, we were watching uh trying to pick a movie, Neith and I, my wife and I were what, what we watched tonight. And I had heard good things about this movie with Mark Rylance, this great character actor called The Outfit. Mm. And he plays a cutter, a guy who makes suits. And the movie feels like it's made in the 40s or 50s. And and it's a really terrific, I highly recommend it. It's really good. It's not lights hitting my face. It's really weird. I'll just go this way. So <laughs> it's so he it's this really great thriller that involves sort of these mob guys and his his tailor shop is kind of a drop-off point for payments and so forth. Anyway, it's it it it's like a play. There's almost all whole thing takes place in this one location. And I really loved it. So I tweeted about how much I love this movie. So one of the two people who wrote the screenplay saw this on Twitter and replied to me. And that was Jonathan McLean, who wrote this, co-wrote the screenplay. But Jonathan McLean said, I was so thrilled that you liked this movie I wrote because, don't know if you know this or not, but I have narrated some of your audio books. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And so I put in a word for him and he did... He did the line maker. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. I was trying to figure out what each one is doing, but that one sounds great. That one really sounds terrific. So what's next? Because you probably have it finished already. You probably have draft one done. Yes. I have I have delivered next year's book. Yeah. I haven't uh I haven't gotten the tests back, the results back from the doctor on that one. I, I've used and that quote of yours so many times because people say, Well, I'm waiting to hear. And I said, Ah, Linwood Barkley says it's like the test from the doctor. And I've actually started writing something uh, that's a little out of my wheelhouse. I have about a third of a book done that's more sort of horror supernatural, which mm -hmm. is a departure for me. Um, but I've started on that and I'm um, having a lot of fun doing it. I'm not sure if it'll be my main book for one year or whether it'll be something else, but I'm messing around with that. But you know what? It's like what you have fun with is what you want to go to get to the table and write with every day. If you don't yeah. like what you're doing, it's not going to work. It's just not no. going to work. So, Absolutely. well, this completely worked for me. I realized that when I pulled this, my husband still had a little more to leave. And now he has to figure out where it came from because this was his bookmark. <laughs> He's going to be, I just was like, oh my gosh, I just lost his place. But he was loving it. Absolutely loving it. I think he stopped reading it for like golf or something like that. You know, something that he you know felt important in his life. But uh no, it's really, really terrific book. And anybody who picks it up, really, I'll start early in the day because it's a page turner, but you're also later on sitting and really thinking about the book. And that's what I really love is not only when I finish the thriller, I go back and I think of how there were these little clues there that you didn't see. And the other, the other thing we didn't talk about is there are little um, sections that are just in italics. And it's, you're trying to figure out like who's talking to who, Jack talking to his father, like what is going on in these little italics. And later on, they're very, very telling <clears throat> of what happens in those moments as well, because yeah. there, there's a lot going on in the book. Is that a good one? Yeah, and I think it's got one of my, it's got, I think it's got one of my best little twists of anyone I've done, yeah. Yeah, and the twist, 
But you know what, what happens is Swiss at the end is boom, boom, boom. A lot of stuff, it doesn't do this, but at the end, you're going like this, going back and forth. And I think that that's one of the things, a lot of people draw you in at the beginning, but then the end is like, okay, it's just here. It's one, but this is not a one. It's a one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, so which is like fabulous. Come Thank on. you as always for joining us. <laughs> it was, it's always a pleasure. I want to see you in person one of these days again. Yes. Come down, come down, come down, into, come down to the city or come out of here and visit us. You can stay mm -hmm. here. It's up by the pool. Talk about books. You could write. I'll give you a little office. Okay. That sounds like a plan. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay. And everybody else will see you next time on Book Reporter Talks too.